Hey everybody, this is an overview of chapter 7 in Douglas Kelly's book, Creation and Change. And um, this is an important chapter because it deals with how do we interpret the days of Genesis. And that's really the heart of the matter in, in this whole debate over uh, the age of the earth. In fact, the age of the earth um, is is really not the main issue. A lot of people make that uh, a big issue, that this is between uh, evolutionist and young earth creationist, or old earth creationist and young earth creationist. That's really not the the main idea here. The main idea is the interpretation of Genesis. It's not the age of the earth. The age of the earth is, a, is secondary to that main issue. So Douglas Kelly's uh, chapter 7 is called The Days of Creation, Their Biblical Meaning. And in this chapter, he reviews the biblical usage of this word day. What does this uh, word mean in its context? And um, how does the Bible use this word? And how should we interpret those days in Genesis? Um, and so it's very important. It's a very important chapter. And uh, it was a chapter that I was really looking forward to, to getting into. Um, so Douglas Kelly starts his discussion right at the beginning of chapter 7 by um, just going over the two major differences between biblical uh, Christianity and secular naturalism. So what is the, the major two differences? We could talk about a lot of things, but what are the two major ones between the biblical view of reality and what the secular naturalists are telling us is reality uh, in regards to origins? The two major differences are, number one, Kelly says, that Christianity is different than secular naturalism because it proclaims an infinite personal God who created the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. So this infinite personal uh, omnipotent God creating the entire cosmos uh, by speaking by speaking it into existence out of nothing. That's the first uh, major difference between biblical Christianity and what it says about reality and what the, the secular naturalist would say is reality. And then the second thing is just the age of the cosmos. So um, it, the age of the cosmos is a difference that, that the, the biblical picture of reality has with uh, secular naturalism. Now that's not the main uh, difference, but it, it does come into play here because of the interpretation of Genesis. So this is not a an issue um, of of people claiming a young earth because of any other reason except for the interpretation of Genesis. So it's a secondary issue, but it is a major difference. Um, the two points of view cannot be reconciled, although many well-meaning Christians have tried to um, to bring these two things together the 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 deep time that the naturalists uh, posit and and the Bible and there's different ways they've done that they've done that through a view called theistic evolution they've done it through a view called day age creationism or progressive creationism and they've done it through another view called the framework hypothesis which we're going to talk about in this video. A little bit and because Douglas Kelly addresses it here in chapter 7. So um, those are the two major differences between biblical Christianity's view of reality and the view of reality that's coming from the secular naturalists who don't believe in the biblical God. And so that that's the difference. That That's the the bridge the unbridgeable chasm that exists between these two views um and like i said there are well-meaning christians that try to bridge those two views but in light of what douglas kelly reviews in this chapter i do not believe that we can bridge those views that those views are radically different and that if you believe the bible is the word of god then you believe that God created the the universe in six days, six 24-hour days, six days as we would uh, count them, um, and not 
not over billions of years. So, um, after discussing um, the biblical usage of the word day, which is in, very important because this whole debate, this whole origins debate really uh, comes down to the interpretation of God's word and what God's word says. And are we going to believe God's word or are we going to believe what the secular naturalists are telling us? Um, and so the interpretation of those days in Genesis are just paramount. They're just com completely the most important aspect of this whole discussion. And so uh, Douglas Kelly comes away from this discussion um, and showing that these days are to be understood naturally, that we don't have to uh, come up with uh, some view of these days that says that they're long ages or, or whatever. So after discussing that, he then discusses this uh, view called the literary framework view. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the literary framework view, um, it's a view that uh, comes from the year uh, 1924. Uh, the gentleman who came up with it, he was a professor. Uh, his name is, I might get get this name wrong, so forgive me if I do. Ari Nordzig. He was a professor, um, not here in the United States. Um, he, he, he came up with this idea, but the framework hypothesis, uh, and I'll, I'll go into what that is. It was popularized by a guy named Meredith Klein. Some of you might have heard of Meredith Klein. Um, he taught at uh, Westminster Seminary. He was an Old Testament professor, and he kind of popularized this view. So basically, the framework hypothesis is this idea that in Genesis we see this beautiful literary uh, arrangement of the text so that, um, and I'm going to show you this, so that the days of Genesis kind of correspond to each other in a literary framework. So you got day one and day four, day two and day five, and day three and day six. And that these um, days of creation are not to be understood as um, chronological, but rather they are to be understood as um, a literary framework of God um, basically creating and then filling. And so his insights into this were that um, there is this, there is a literary framework that this was arranged in a certain way. Um, and so, the problem with that, and, and they would understand uh, Meredith Klein and, and some of these other guys, and a, another guy that believes this um, is Bruce Waltke. You might have heard of him. Um, he's a biblical scholar. Um, they, they would say that they still consider Genesis to be historical. Um, so they're not saying um, this is mythological. It's completely mythological. But what they do is they emphasize the theological and the literary aspect of Genesis and kind of ignore um, the historical aspect of it. And they certainly wouldn't say that these days were to be taken as literary 24-hour days. So, and what they've done in this view is they've created this kind of dualism. Now I'm going to show you this again. This dualism where up here you have the literary or theological reading of Genesis over against kind of the historical uh, the historical view of Genesis. And um, Dr. Kelly, his whole point in this chapter when he's addressing this is that you don't have to do that, that we can recognize that there are uh, beautiful literary aspects of Genesis. And we believe Genesis was written by Moses um, and it was revealed to Moses, um, the information that's in it, um, and and possibly um, brought through oral tradition. Um, but the point is, this, this text in Genesis um, has literary beauty to it. So if that's true, does that mean that we're not to take it as historical, that we're not to take it as literal, as natural? Are we not to read it naturally so that it is a chronological record of God's um, creating during a, a real 
six day creation week with the seventh day where God rested? Are we are we to look at the literary aspects of this text and conclude that these should not be taken in the straightforward sense? And Douglas Kelly would say no. Um, we can recognize the beauty that's here in the text and that and that there is some correspondence between um, the days of creation so that God is preparing the earth and then he's filling the earth and he's prepared he prepares the seas and then he fills the seas he prepares the dry land and then he fills the dry land there's nothing wrong with seeing that because it is there um, but why would we expect why wouldn't we expect that? Why would we think that this kind of does away with the historical reading? That doesn't follow. And Douglas Kelly wants us to know that. Um, and, and I believe, and Douglas Kelly believes, the, what they're doing here is they're trying to get around sort of the normal sense of reading um, these days in the creation week. Okay, They're trying to... Um, you know, we can't look in their hearts, we can't look at their motivations, but in many cases, when you have these Christian scholars who are trying to come up with these day-age theory or the framework hypothesis, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, um, they're trying to reconcile these millions of years and, and this earth history that the naturalists have come up with and reconcile it with the Bible. And what happens is is the interpretation of the Bible is what suffers, and 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 so we need to start with God's word. We need to start with God's word. If we believe this is a revelation from God, um, that this is special revelation, we need to start with God's word, and we can let science kind of do its thing, but understand that science is not the final word. That God's word can be trusted. So. Um, so that's basically what chapter 7 is all about. Um, and and then at the end of chapter 7, in his uh, technical and bibliographical notes, he has an overview of how the New Testament treats um, the book of Genesis as far as how it handles the people and the events of Genesis. Does, does the New Testament, Jesus and the apostles, do they treat uh, Adam and Eve and uh, um, Cain and Abel and uh, Abraham and and Isaac and Jacob and and everyone in between. Do they and, and Joseph? Do they do they treat these people as historical, real people, and real events? Do they treat the flood as a real event? And the answer is yes. And Douglas Kelly shows that uh, at the end of the chapter. But real quick before I go, I want to give you an example of how a, a text can be literary literarily beautiful, and at the same time, tell us about historical reality. The text is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. So in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, um, go check that text out, read it. Um, we have here elegant literary form, but we also have historical reality of what's being described in the incarnation of Christ. So it's beautiful in the way that Paul arranges it. And this was said to be a hymn. So it's arranged in this beautiful way, and yet it's it's describing something real, something that happened in the real world, reality, historical reality, and it, those two things don't have to be at odds to, with each other. So uh, I encourage you, go check out Philippians 2, 5 through 11, and read it carefully and see how it's it's arranged there. And then understand that just because the Bible is arranged in a certain way doesn't mean that it's not true. That the Bible speaks about the real world. It speaks to the real world. And that's why this whole discussion is so important. Because the Bible is speaking to real people in a real world. And that...